is that's fine he was climbing mountains and he was taking flying lessons when he was in his 70s so he was a very amazing human being yes yeah. yes okay okay, okay. well so the questions well wait you're not live yet he hasn't started well, yet well we're about we're about to start uh it's nine o'clock and i'm just going to wait for everyone to join we currently have um 75 people joining and hopefully and i'm sure it will grow we're already up to 77. <clears throat> let me make um leia a host i can do that Okay. Okay. Good evening, everyone. What an exciting evening. What, welcome back to Mondays with Maishi. Tonight, we have the honor of having the very famous, world-renowned Dr. Eva Ager, who um, I just learned a couple of minutes ago is actually a direct einical, a direct descendant of Rabbi Akiva Ager, with whom uh, many of us are, are very familiar with his works and his Torah study and his Torah writings, his, his brilliant, brilliant writings. And I just learned that uh, Dr. Eger is a direct descendant. Do you know how many generations it is? Mm -hmm. um, all I know that, uh, that I take very importantly myself as a good role model to young people because young people need good role models so they stay in school, that they don't smoke pot because it interferes with the brain. And the best thing that I can do is watch the movie, the, um, the movie of the, the, karate kid. the Karate Kid. But he was asking about uh, Rabbi Eager and uh, what the re how many generations back that would have gone. Oh, I have no idea how okay. to end. But I know that I'm the family of member of the Chabad and they are my children and I love the Chabad. They take anything, anyone, anytime and they, over, all over the world. I consider them the ambassadors for yes. peace. Chabad and is unbelievable, really Absol unbelievable. And we have, and we actually, we have some Chabad representatives on tonight. Uh, one yes. of them actually is Dr. Elliot Kaplan, and the reason I mention his name is because Dr. Kaplan intro first introduced me to Viktor Frankl's paradoxical intention. And we, have, we have been studying paradoxical intention for about 10 years now, and we would like to um, discuss that with you a little further on in the show, and I hope that he will uh, present himself and some of our thoughts. Yes, well, this is very, very, very difficult because uh, it's easier said than done. Yes. You know, when I asked a person, who didn't want to go to Vietnam. And when he was meeting uh, the people who will make a decision, he wanted to stutter. And the harder he started to stutter, it just didn't come. Yes. It, didn't, it, didn't, it didn't come the way he wanted to order himself to do something uh, and using the paradoxical intention. I think it, it's very complicated it's not so easy to to practice uh, your fears and knowing that 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 fear and love does not coexist. So I think it's very important for us to acknowledge that we're not born with fear. We learn it, we practice it, and fear and love does not coexist. Yes. So. I, I learned I learned how to really look at the guards that they were they were the prisoners, not me. And yes. my beautiful God guided me 
So when people ask, where was God in Auschwitz? God did not kill my parents. People did. Yes. So it's yes. very important. My God is with me every day when I come home. I thank God for bringing me home safe. And uh, my God is the love that I carry with me. Without that, I don't think I would have been here talking to you. Especially not Dr. Edith Eva Eager. Yes. yes. <laughs> the person who went back to school. Yes. Yes. Well, that, I think that's, it's that's, that, that's, a, that's inspirational for all of us, you know, putting aside clinical therapy. That's just yes. an inspiration that we all took out of the book, The Choice. That was so written when you, when you were 90 years young. When I am 93 years young, and I think young, and I live in a present. I go through the valley of the shadow of death. I don't camp there or set up household there. Part of me was left in Auschwitz. I call it my cherished wound. Wow. In my well, heart. Dr. Eger, um, tonight I am co-hosting this show with Leia Iskowitz. And yes. uh, Leia read and reread the book multiple times and has told me about what a great impact your book, The Choice, has had on her personally, what a deep, profound impact. And so I'd like to turn over the floor to Leia for a moment to ask you a few questions about the book. And then I hope later in the show to get a little bit more clinical and discuss logotherapy. Is that okay? Well, I think it's very important for me to be useful to you. I never ask people, how can I help you? I'm not Humpty Dumpty, I don't put anybody together, but I like to be useful for people to use this time to really take stock of their lives and not to go back, but to have a new beginning, especially couples. Yeah, so can I jump in with a question, Dr. Eager? Thank you. Yeah, so it, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eager. So in your book, you talk about um, the concept of victimhood, and you talk about how you met two paraplegics, uh, uh, Tom and Chuck, with the same condition. And one of them was just totally in victim mode, totally depressed, couldn't get up, and one was cheerful. Yeah. Can you tell us more about your philosophy around being a victim instead of, versus being a thriving person? You know, if you look at it in a bigger picture, I think we are all victims of victims. And that's why we have to stop blaming because we have to take responsibility for our lives, to take responsibility for our thinking because our thinking will create our feelings and to take responsibility for thinking, feeling and behaving. None of the positive uh, talk does any good unless it's followed with a positive action. So yeah. if, if you want to lose weight, then I'm going to tell you what to do about it. But then you tell me you cannot give up my Hungarian chocolate cake. Uh, I, know, <laughs> I know nothing will happen until you tell me that you're not going to put sugar in your cappuccino tomorrow morning. So how do you talk about taking tragedies? I'm gonna quote you, despite and really because of the struggles and the tragedies in our lives, each of us has the capacity to gain the perspective that transforms us from victim to thriver. How did you take your tragedy and turn it into strength? That you turn everything in life into an opportunity. An opportunity to discover something that you never thought was possible. I was able to somehow think of the man who took my blood many times. And when I asked him, why are you taking my blood? And his answer was to aid, aid the German soldiers so they can finally win the war and take over the world, namely America. 
and I couldn't yank my arm away, I wouldn't be here telling you what I said to myself, you stupid idiot. With my blood, the ballerina, you're never going to win the war. That he could not take away from me. So you're not reacting, but responding. That's what you learn. That's Even what you though, learn. And yes. what would you say to, to listeners who say, I really am a victim of really tough circumstances? I would ask what's good about it. Someone comes in. I'm depressed. And my question is, what's good about being depressed? He says, nothing. And then I say, could it be that when you're depressed, you can get away with less? Maybe you don't have to wash the dishes. Maybe you don't have to take the garbage out. That everything has a secondary gain. I look for the... Uh, but I want people to feel the rage. There is no letting go of anything unless you go through the rage. Don't cover garlic with chocolate. It doesn't taste good. So I think everything has a secondary gain, and I certainly look for it because every behavior is somehow satisfying a need. And if you have the need to be a victim, you're always going to find the victimizer. And that happens with couples. It kind of goes back and forth, back and forth. The victim becomes the victimizer, victimized, and they go back and forth. This is a good time, just like in football. Time out. Regroup, redecide, not go back, a new beginning. So the break out of the victim role. What was that? You're saying break break out of the cycle of victim and victimizer. Exactly. Exactly. And labels. Get rid of the labels. I'm no more and no less than a human being. I'm not superhuman. I'm not subhuman. But I know I will never retire. I know I'm going to work as long as I live. Because that gives me meaning and purpose in life. That I don't say why me, I say what now. Uh, can Dr. I ask you? Go ahead. Dr. Ager, between stimulus and response, there is an intervening variable, the existential choice, the freedom to choose our attitude toward any given external yeah. stimulus. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In Hebrew, we actually call this the nekudas habachira. There's, there's so much talk about this in, um, in uh, Judea, you know, Judaic literature. Um, can you talk a little bit to that? I mean, I think by now this is this has been a concept that Frankel spread, and everybody is aware of it. And yet, at the same time, there are people who struggle to execute this concept in their functioning and daily living. I think Auschwitz was an opportunity for me to discover my inner resources. Because the more you wait for someone to liberate you, you're never going to make it. I knew exactly who was going to die in Auschwitz. I would watch that person, and I knew they giving up slowly. One girl told me, we're going to be liberated by Christmas. Christmas came and went, she died the next day. Wow. So it's very important not to react, but to respond. Take a deep breath when someone is angry at you and you tell yourself, the more they talk, the more relaxed I become. You take the negative stimuli, immediately turn it. And that means you're not allowing that stimulus for me to give my power away. Take back your power. Don't argue with people. If they tell you you're a stupid idiot, you say thank you for your opinion. You know that you, it takes two to fight. It takes one to stop it. OK, Leah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. so I wanted to quote you um, on forgiveness, Dr. Eager, where you say, to forgive is to grieve for what happened, for what didn't happen, 
and to give up the need for a different past. Can you tell us more about that? I, I think I don't have any godly power. I cannot forgive anybody for anything, but I know that I want to be free. And if I'm still hating, I'm still a prisoner. So you see, freedom comes with a price. Like you give up the need for other people's approval. It's okay if nobody will just, just love me. And give up the need to please others. But most of all, give up your perfectionism. Because perfectionism will make you procrastinate. So I am very much into being human, not subhuman or superhuman, but to make mistakes and it takes courage to be average. I, I just want to remind everyone, if, if you have a question, please raise your hand on the bottom right of the screen and we'll try to get, get to it at some point. Um, there's still so many questions and points that we want to discuss with Dr. Ager. Uh, but if you do have a question, raise your hand and eventually we'll, we'll get to you and call on you. Um, Dr. Ager, we're in logotherapy is the place for rage and how do you see rage as part of the healing process? I think logotherapy is good when you're not looking for long-term therapy. I think it's, it's good if you really want to just find a way for you to get up in the morning and acknowledge that life is just one day that morning sunshine is not going to come back to be able to live in a present and to be able to make a name for yourself. So when you are in, in your deathbed, I know I'm going to be very happy because I will not ask what the world has given me, but uh, you know, in what way I was able to give and commit my life to others because self-love is self-care. And I think that's not narcissistic. So it's very, very important to tell people, which I do, when you get up in the morning, look in the mirror and say, I love me. That's not narcissistic at all. Everything starts and ends with you. We're born again. We're born again and we hope to live a meaningful life yes. by, uh, by showing up for others, just like I love the Chabad so much that totally committed all over the world yes. to make the world a better place. Yes. And how would you describe rage as part of the healing process of psychotherapy or logotherapy? Yes, yes. you have to go through the rage, but don't get stuck in there. See, that's what happens. People can get stuck and uh, and when you constipate it, you have to concentrate on a movement. You know, you got to have to have a goal. And when you have a goal, I call it an arrow, that you follow an arrow. Because when I came to America, I came from Germany to New York. But I know there was a big storm and, and, the, and we turned somewhere. But I know the skipper came back because we went from Germany to New York, not to China. So I think it's good to have a goal, but also very important to know what you focus on. So what you focus on is totally in alignment to get you closer to the goal. So rage is go, you go through the rage, scream it out, because what comes out of your body doesn't make you ill, what stays in there does. And I never told anyone I was in Auschwitz. I was in denial. I was in delusion. I would never, never ask anybody to do what I did. I just wanted to be a Yankee Doodle Dandy. Right. Look at my accent. I spent three years at the university trying to get rid of my Hungarian accent. You see how far I have gone with that? <laughs> Come on. Yeah. I guess I guess three years can't trump the other ninety. 
I, I speak Hungarian accent. You take it or leave it, that's okay. Right, right, okay. Dr. Igor, um, along the lines of this range, you talk yeah. about embracing dark emotions to cherish yeah. the wound. Can you tell us about cherishing the wound? I cherish the wound because I am today a very compassionate listener. I'm realizing I have two ears and one mouth and I talk less and I listen more and listen more and say, tell me more and listening even to a white supremacy kid who came to see me and told me how he's going to kill all the Jews. And instead of dragging him into the corner and telling him, who do you think you're talking to? I provided an atmosphere. We women are very good at that. <laughs> we are good providing a place that everybody can feel any feelings without the fear of being judged. There is no right or wrong feeling. There is only my feeling. And I give you permission to feel any feelings without the fear of being judged. Well, you used your wounds to have more compassion for other people. Yeah. Life is difficult. I look at your birth certificate. There is no guarantee, there is no certainty, but there is probability. And Auschwitz gave you the probability to discover that inner strength to never allow anything and anyone to murder your spirit. I could throw me in the gas chamber any minute. I had no power over it. But I had my spirit. And, and you write about how that was your last lesson from your mother, the last words. Exactly. And that's exactly what happened when my mom told me in a cattle car, we don't know where we're going, honey. We don't know what's going to happen. Just remember, no one can take away from you what you put here in your own mom. Uh, probably told you the same thing, that no one can take away from you what you put in your mind. And that's what Auschwitz was, an opportunity to discovering my inner strength that led me to go to school and graduate with honors and, and to be able to be 93. And I don't care about numbers at all. I think you have to be old to be young because you give up your need for other people's approval of you. I certainly do. I certainly do. And I'm so happy to be with you tonight. You know, uh, I am among my colleagues. And, uh, and so people don't come to me, they're sent to me. Right. The most obnoxious person is your best teacher. That's right. Humans can fill their existential vacuum with meaning. Mm -hmm. So I have a tough, what I consider a tough question that I face in, in, the, thera in the clinical room. You, you write how many clients who suffer from depression really suffer from their existential vacuum. They're bored, they lack goals and personal aims, etc. What I sometimes struggle with is Whereas existentialism certainly believes this, how can we get a, a patient or a person to identify the specific things that might eventually bring them meaning? When you have people who are in certain depressed states, they can't fathom why even creating meaning would be worthwhile for them. I, I always ask people, don't call me a shrink, call me a stretch. stretch. And yes. Stretch. <laughs> so that instead of going back and doing the same thing over and over again, which Einstein said is the definition of insanity, right. look 
look at the same thing from a different perspective. That's what I do. I become your ophthalmologist. I'm looking at the same thing as an opportunity for an opportunity to discover, not to react, to be able to take a deep breath and uh, to become a very compassionate listener. And the more choices you have, the less you're going to feel like a victim. I, uh, I refuse to be a victim. And I know that victims cannot really be without a victimizer. So instead of revolving, my daughter calls it edism. That's one of them. Instead of revolving, you're evolving. evolving. That you go through the metamorphosis and shed the chrysalis so you can fly freely like a butterfly. And uh, that's really what I hope to be a guide. I, I like to call myself a guide from, a, from darkness to light, from, from uh, darkness to hopefully a new beginning. And everything becomes an opportunity for discovery, not recovery, but discovery. So I am a kind of a midwife tonight, and you can give birth to the you that was meant to be. You know what? If you are a firstborn child, and if you marry a firstborn, you have two bosses. And, and they both want to be right. And, and the middle children are peacemakers. They want everybody to get along with everyone else. Do you know how you call a young people? Charming manipulators. I don't know if any of you fit into any of that or not. I don't like to really label things, but I think sometimes you want to really acknowledge that I was the youngest child in my family. And I told my mother to give me the chocolate, otherwise I'm gonna say that bad word when we were <laughs> taking the train to go to Budapest to have my air. Uh, my my eyes done. I was a very bad. Um, I had a very bad uh, eyes, and that had to be operated. And one of the doctor client, a Jewish doctor in a Jewish hospital in Budapest, did my surgery without any anesthetics in 1938, wow. and I was screaming my heart out but I had the most successful surgery. Wow. No. Good. Yeah. I, I think we understand your, where your resilience comes from. We understand where your resilience comes from. Yes, the resilience uh, is, uh, is very important. And, uh, and not to allow anybody to get to you, really. People are just practicing free speech. Yeah. Especially when you hear the word you. You are stupid. You are this. When I hear the word you, I say someone is going to dump on me. And the longer they talk, the more relaxed I become. Take the negative stimuli, turn it into positive right away. Don't give your power away so quickly. Maybe. So I'll show you as a classroom. All we had was each other then, and all we have is each other now. So we want to empower each other with our differences, that you can be you and I can be I, but that doesn't mean I'm better than you or less than you or any of that. They're just one of a kind. We'll never have another you, never, ever. That's exciting. There'll never be another you. If you leave this room, no one can replace you. That's very exciting to me. I'm unique, I'm one of a kind. Dr. Ager, uh, I, I sometimes wonder, one of the things that we're taught in psychotherapy is that a patient needs to come to certain realizations on their own, uh, et cetera. And mm -hmm. I wonder how you influence or induce the process of making choices or free choice 
in psychotherapy. I can imagine a patient feeling pushed against the wall or feeling like the therapist is running, running faster than the patient by trying to induce you know, this idea of free choice or creating meaning, create meaning for yourself, as opposed to you know, more classical psychoanalysis, which was more about being with the client. Can you talk to that a little? I never treat a person as they are. I treat them as if they were what they're capable of becoming. And then they rise to the occasion. Uh, if you treat a person as they are, they usually um, not move. Um, people are comfortable where they are and change is very scary. And so I, uh, I especially teenagers, I treat them as, uh, as the future ambassador for peace and um, I'm a role model to them and to stay in school. And I told them what my mother told me, that uh, I'm always looking to find the light after darkness. And um, Auschwitz was um, a place that made me who I am today. Well, that, that's I don't know. fascinating. So, so you're saying you hold the bar for them and then they rise to the occasion. I think people uh, rise to the occasion when I treat them as if they were, but I know that they are capable of becoming. Wow. Like being sent, like stop lying, like, uh, like uh, um, especially about uh, not presenting themselves someone who they are not at all. And to regain your true self, this is a good time now in COVID to re regain because we give up our true self to fit the family dynamics. You know, most of our Nobel Prize winners are either, um, you're either the firstborn child or the only child. Is that right? My son got the Nobel Prize in economics, and uh, his uh, his name is Robert Engel in economics. And I was I was there. I was there myself. But it is very important to really see how you give up your true self to fit the dynamics, because I know that. Uh, That's I lost you. It, it's a pen. Athena, you got a few. There. I just want to tell you that after two girls, my son was born and he did not develop like the other two. He didn't sit up on time. He didn't walk. He didn't talk. And at the age of four, I took him up to Johns Hopkins because five doctors told me in Texas that I have to prepare my son to go to a school for retarded children. We don't use that term anymore. And a Dr. Clark sat me down a week after, after I, I arrived and, and he took my son for a week. He sat me down and he said, your son is not retarded. He's going to be what you make of him. Imagine how I'm shaking. Well. And he said he's going to need is going to need speech therapy, occupational therapy, uh, whatever. How much do I owe you? Ten dollars. I took my son back. I dropped out of school, and my son John graduated as a top ten student from the University of Texas. Wow. That's you never give up. You never ever give up. You have a goal. And then, of course, pay attention what you're focusing on so it can get you closer to that goal. Well, so this is a good time for everyone to really rethink and re-decide as to what happens when we don't have anything to blame anymore. Well, that you take full responsibility for your thinking, your feeling, and your behavior. 
Amazing. Let's take a question from someone in the audience. RL, is it Rachelea or something Ruthie. else? <laughs> Ruthie, okay. I can't All raise right. my hand, so if I can go afterwards, Chevy Weinberger. Yeah, Chevy, you, you could go next, sure. Just keep it on mute for now, okay? Uh, Dr. Eager, it's a pleasure to be here. I read your book a few months ago and I reread it uh, yesterday and today. And it's amazing to hear you speak. Um, and I just think about how when you were 16 and you came to Auschwitz and um, you had a very good life until then. How, how did you come up with that idea that we have to make our own choices and we have to think about the future and the hope? You know, because I wonder how, how we could raise our children with that idea too. You know, the kids who are always claiming that they're the victim and things aren't going the way they want to because of things that are beyond their control. And yet you show how we are in control and we can do it through our minds. And I just wonder how we could give that over and how you came to that realization. When you ask a child, why do you do that? The child would tell you, because I feel like it. Children don't care about consequences. As an adult, I still feel like it, but I don't act upon it unless it is in my best interest. So, you know, when we are children, we sit in the back of the car and we mess around, but someone is driving the car. So the question I always ask, you want to be a baby or a big boy, a baby or a big girl, because there is no freedom without responsibility. By back, parents, don't spoil your children. They were the first one to die in Auschwitz. Don't ever spoil your children or grandchildren. They give up. They give up. So I think uh, there are many, many things that I can tell you about sport children. And uh, unfortunately, many children are very spoiled. They get a toy when they don't even ask for it. And uh, I, 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 like, I like to write a constitution that every behavior has a consequence, not punishment, a consequence. I am very much for writing a constitution for every family. So there is cooperation, not competition or domination. And that's what we had to have in Auschwitz. My teacher was there from my Jewish school. So when, when Dr. Mengele came and wanted to be danced, uh, somebody to dance for him, she gave me that finger. I never remember anything but that finger who told me to do what, uh, what I'm asked to do. Don't question, no. And I sure did dance for Dr. Mengele and closed my eyes and pretended that the music was Tchaikovsky. And I was dancing the Romeo and Juliet at the Budapest Opera House. Today I work with sexual abuse. And the woman comes to me and tells me that she was sexually abused, but how she can tell me because I was in Auschwitz. And my answer is, I knew the enemy, you didn't. So there is no comparison, yeah. no, no. If you were sexually abused, the question is, when did your childhood end? That's a good question. And the Thank second you. question, would you like to be married to you? <laughs> good question to think about. That's a very important question. Important perspective. Let's take let's take another question from Chevy. Just want to give a hats off to Chevy, who this was actually her idea to bring on Dr. Ager. So um, thank you, Chevy. Thank you. Hi, hi, Dr. Ager. Um, Rivka's here. Hi. We miss you. Hi. Thank you. When can we come visit you again? I love you. Love you. Love you. Um, my question is um, first. I'm so glad to see you again. Uh, my question is. Um, what's the diff can you talk about the difference between refusing to be a victim and being in denial? Being a victim? The difference between being a victim and or being in denial? To be a, the difference between refusing to be a victim and being in denial. 
Uh, the denial is a defense mechanism. Denial, delusion, or minimization. Oh, it wasn't such a big thing. Other people suffered. Yeah, I think it's very important to look at the defense mechanism and the excuses. I, I think suffering makes you stronger. I can really stand for that. Life is about suffering, and suffering is feeling and makes you stronger. If you just allow it to tell yourself, I don't like it, it's inconvenient, it's obnoxious, and it's temporary, and I can survive it. No yes, but, yes, and. I am here, and not say why me, what now? That's what I did when a communist put my husband in jail. I took my big diamond ring, I put this in my little girl's diaper, and I took my husband out overnight and ended up in Vienna at the Rothschild Hospital that is, that is being taken care of by the American Jewish population. Well. When I was in Miami, I was talking to the Jewish community they're very successful people, and I told them that they may be helping a young mother like me. So, so I think giving is getting. Giving is getting. And we Jewish people give wherever we can. And so I'm here also giving of my time, even though I haven't been well for about a week now. I, uh, I, I'm getting better, but I wasn't gonna give up being with you. After that, I'm gonna put on my night gun and go nighty night, but I'm so happy that I can see the beautiful faces and the beautiful people, my sisters, my brothers, that we all are a family. We had to be a family in Auschwitz. We had to form a family. If you were just for the me, 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 you didn't make it. All we had was each other then, and all we have is each other now. And remember, you're beautiful just the way you are. You see, and I love that when people say, God doesn't make junk, you know. I think kids have lovely things to say about that that you matter, you're one of a kind, one of a kind, beautiful people. And I think I'm the oldest here, uh, but I'm old and I have a very young heart. And age is wonderful because you don't get smart, you get wise. Look at the fiddler on the roof, look at that woman. She believes that her husband has to know that he makes all the decisions in the world, and guess who makes the decision? She doesn't have the ego needs. She's not competing. She knows exactly how to have the heart and soul of the family that God created. So there's a lot to be learned about Fiddler on the Roof. So much, especially when the wife is telling the husband that the daughter is gonna marry a guy. Remember when she has a dream? Oh my God, the most creative, brilliant woman. Schools don't give it to you. Schools. There's the IQ and the EQ, the emotional IQ. And that's what Auschwitz gives you. To be practical, to know, not to ever leave an opportunity when you have to give someone a choice. My second book is uh, The Gift, because after, after the choice, people ask me to write something that is more practical, a how-to book. So my second book is The, uh, the Gift, and you may pick that up too. But I'm very happy to tell you 
that I'm writing a third book with my daughter, and it's going to be recipes. Lots of recipes, and hope it's going to come along with my daughter, who likes to play a lot of golf, so I don't know how far we're going to go with that one. Okay. But I, I, I will never give up. I never will ever retire. I don't believe in retirement at all. Dr. Eger, let's take a question from Shmuel. Go ahead, Shmuel. Dr. Eger, Dr. Eger, first of all, thank you for uh, being here tonight and thank you for writing your book. I'm gonna make two comments and maybe you could share your thoughts about them about that I kind of experienced when reading your book. Um, and, and I found it different than many of the other books about survivors um, and narratives about people who experienced the Holocaust. Um, that, and it's kind of where I saw it as being distinct. And that is that, first of all, the, the picture you painted um, about the pre-war experiences was not like this perfect image. I think a lot of the narratives which I've read throughout my um, experiences all kind of painted this picture that, you know, life before 1939 was some kind of utopia. Um, and and I, I found your your narrative to be very humanizing. And then second of all, your narrative um, about your account in Auschwitz, um, I, very often I had to put down the book um, after reading just one or two pages um, because you were talking about your emotions. It, it wasn't just raw facts. You actually were sharing what you were feeling and, and there would be times I would be like, okay, that's enough for one night. Um, you know, I, I, I I, I need to digest that. And, and I thought those two pieces were, were super powerful. Um, and, and I want to share, thank you for sharing those perspectives. And I don't know if they go together for you in some way. Thank you, you know. I want to tell you that I went to a Jewish school and when we came out, children were spitting at me and calling me a Christ killer. So that was before Hitler. That was before Hitler that I was told that I'm a Christ killer. And um, unfortunately, uh, genocide is happening as we speak. But as I told you before, never in the history of mankind, such a scientific and systematic annihilation of people existed. So it's not comparable to anything. And hopefully I do everything in my power to see to it that your children and grandchildren, I have seven great grandsons that I will never ever experience what I did. But my book is on that living room table. So write your book. If I can do it, you can do it. So start your book. Well, well, well we might work, we're, we're also considering starting Maybe at 85 years old, though. <laughs> we might write the book when we turn 85, because we want to start early. Uh, Dr. The best. You, you are wonderful, wonderful people and good role models. You know, children don't do what we say. They do what they see. And they see you being up here. They see you getting up in the morning and committing yourself to someone other than you. And that is wonderful. And I congratulate you that you even uh, want to know about history because unfortunately, January 6th, when I saw a man wearing a shirt that 6 million wasn't enough, I knew that history has a tendency to repeat itself. And uh, and that was a terrible day, January 6th, when I saw such hate, such unfortunate, terrible Dr. day. Dr. Eger, you know, I, I think that there's, there's research that, po that positive attitude, yeah. Yeah. Optimism and positive attitude are a, a lengthen one's life. And I'm starting yes. to wonder if you're living evidence of that. I think I like to be a realist. 
a realist. I, I want to be as realistic as I can, but anything I say, I lived. I yeah. say what I live. So right. that's that's where I am. And and my best education, of course, was in Auschwitz when I didn't know four o'clock in the morning whether I'm going to end up in the gas chamber or not when we took a shower. I didn't know whether gas or water is going to come out. And that is a terrible place to be now, too. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Right. The level of trauma these people have. Dr. Ager, could, like, could we talk for a minute, for a moment, about paradoxical intention? Because that is one of our, one of our favorite interventions. And I'm wondering if we can, if you can talk a little bit to paradoxical intention. Uh, um, we've spent about 10 years studying it, myself and some colleagues, and we we finally think we understand to some degree the mechanism of how mm -hmm. paradoxical interventions work and how they're therapeutic. We're wondering if you would share your perspective on why they work and how they are therapeutic. Yeah, you have you have the literature with you, and all you have to do is just read that. But I think it's a very complicated thing, and you have to be a very, very, very experienced Skills. therapist. Yes. yes. Don't don't start with paradoxical intention unless you're a very highly, highly, highly experienced good good uh, therapist. One and, of the uh, things that that I've identified in paradoxical yeah. interventions, not necessarily only in paradoxical intention, but in general interventions that are paradoxical, is that they seem to connect with the patient's truth. So the patient comes in saying, I want to stop smoking. I want to uh, stop feeling being depressed. I want to get over my anxiety. And in reality, we know that there is a greater part of them that really needs that anxiety smoking, depression, or whatever it is. And what I found with... So when I ask someone what's good about smoking, when he gives me the silver cigarette case, you know, I want to stop smoking. And then I ask what's good about smoking. And uh, he says to me, he's my friend. Your friend I can... I can reach for it any time. Yeah. See, there is the secondary gain that that's where you want to really hopefully go that any behavior satisfies a need. Yes, and, and so and so that's why I feel that when we push the opposition on the client, we are actually connecting with a deeper truth within them. And that's how I see the paradox healing the client. As long as you know, you feel good afterwards. You know, it's not what we do, it's how we feel afterwards. Whether we are revolving or evolving. evolving. Yeah. Okay. Yes. We still have so many, so many questions from the audience. So let's jump in, Asan, I'll go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Ager. Uh, I just want to say that I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your work. My grandfather was liberated from the same uh, Gunskriechen uh, camp as you, and I actually gave him your book and we discussed it at length. Um, oh, my God. Yeah. I, I, met the, I met the man who liberated me. Oh, really? His name is Alan Moskin, M-O-S-K-I-N. He was on 60 Minutes. And now we are in touch. He told me what Gunskirchen was like, how cannibalism broke out, how yeah. people were eating a dead horse. I yeah. didn't know about that, but I know that cannibalism broke out and I didn't want to touch human flesh. Yes, you, you, write, you write that you actually had that choice to make. I had a choice. I asked God and God told me to look down and I had grass to eat. And I remember choosing one blade of grass over and against the other. I can't is not in my vocabulary. 
when I go to a classroom, I put I can't equals I'm helpless. And then I take the apostrophe and the T. I can. Why? Because I think I can. Go ahead, Asal. Yeah. So uh, again, I, I can't tell you how much of a, how great of a privilege it is for me to, to, to be able to speak to you. Um, I'm glad you're working... here. So I, I actually spent the first few years of my career working with the military because of my appreciation for the American military and what they did for my grandfather. And, and, and it's interesting you bring up June 6th because he, at uh, January 6th, he talks about it the same way that you just talked about it. So there's a lot of connections here and I, I really appreciate everything that you said. Um, very quickly, I have two quick questions. How do we balance validating our client's experience while also prodding them to grow? How do we not invalidate them when we ask them to try and be the bigger person in the relationship, to try and shift that the was, dynamic? That was then and this is now. And I did the best I could then. If I knew then what I know now, I would have done things differently. So that's how you get rid of guilt. See, my parents had tickets to go to America and they never used it. So you want to get rid of guilt, which is in the past, and you want to get rid of worry, which is in the future. Mm -hmm. Mothers worry a lot. We worry about things that never happened. I think that the worst thing we mothers can do is worry. And we think it's a concern and it's not, it's not. I live in the present. I can only touch you now. Right. And okay, and, and if I can, just one other quick question. Working with clients who have been incredibly traumatized through their lives, multiple traumas from multiple different people, how can we help them find inner love? Because all the world has told them externally is that they are not lovable. How do we help clients grow from the inside? Well, you know, I don't help anybody. I never ask, how can I help you? But I do ask, how can I be useful to you? See, it's, uh, you know, I'm not here to fix anybody, but I'm here to give them a choice because the more choices you have, the less you feel like a victim. And, and, and I, I think it's very important for you as a child of a survivor to really know you can take it from generation to generation or you can stop something from going from generation to generation. That we were not victims, we were victimized. It's not who we are as people. We are beautiful people have gone through a lot of terrible bad things that was done to us, that made us go role models today. And so I consider myself a, a very good role model because I never stopped growing. I'm still climbing the mountain and I sleep and I climb and I never stop climbing. I have yet to arrive. I'm still in the process of becoming that's a good word, becoming. Coming. I have to arrive. I'm still in a, I'm still climbing that mountain. And I'm so happy that I'm with you today. And, uh, and knowing that somehow the Jewish people uh, were uh, very, very, very good survivors because they were slaves and they were walking for some years on the desert and we survived the Holocaust and we have a state of Israel. Amazing. Dr. Anger, tell, tell the audience what you told me. <clears throat> I think it was before the show about uh, you and your boyfriend and your desire to be uh, warriors. Yes. My boyfriend and I were uh, Zionists uh, par excellence and uh, looking for a future that had meaning and purpose for us to be in a place called Palestine. 
And then look what happened. I'm here with you at 93. And I, I think that uh, it's good for every one of us to know that we matter. We matter in my limited capacity. I'm going to do everything I can to tell people what happens when good people do bad things. Bad things, very bad things. Yes, yes. And not to deny it and not to ever forget it or even overcome it, but to come to terms with it. There is a special place in my heart. I call it my cherished wound. Well, oh, beautiful. Let's take another question from Chaya. Go ahead, Chaya. Hello. Um, first of all, Dr. Eager, it's a, it's a it's an honor. It's an honor to to meet you and um, being able to ask a question is somewhat of a bucket list moment for me right now, um, because to be able to you know, to actually speak to the author of one of my favorite books and also to um, be able to speak to somebody that I look up to is um, kind of almost like a dream come true. But I have a question on what you said before about not spoiling children. Um, so much of, you know, in, in the work that I do, a lot of what I see is parents feeling guilty. Um, and sometimes I myself am, am also feeling guilty about what is the balance between giving kids enough so that they feel a part of a part of the group and so that they're socially accepted and all that and and also not spoiling them would you be able to speak to that balance of as parents um as both parents ourselves and as people that work a lot with parents um who also have this question where where can we find the balance between spoiling um between not spoiling our children um, and making sure that they're ready for what life throws at them, but also um, giving them the opportunity to feel comfortable within their social surroundings. I think the best thing for children is a happy marriage. That you never, never yell at each other, that you're kind to each other, that you fight in front of the children, that you can agree to disagree, that the children know that they are safe. Children need to know that the world is a safe place and the facts are friendly. And that's why the best thing for the children is not for you to tell your husband when he comes home, I call it social noises, how are you? Fine. Did you have a good day? Yeah. What do you want to do tonight? I don't know. What do you want to do? I just want to please you. Well, I just want to please you. You're going nowhere. Social noises. It's better to say, gee, it's good to see you. I missed you, you know, and, and make statements that I feel and I think and I would like and I am willing to compromise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's not so yeah. much about the material. Are you? That's a stupidest question. Mm -hmm. I used to ask my patients, How are you? And they would say, Fine. And I knew they're not fine. And the next time I said, Gee, it's good to see you. I miss you. It's a, I create that atmosphere. We women create a wonderful atmosphere for everyone in a family. So who takes care of you? Yeah. See your husband takes care of the children in a way that, that the children know that their father is take care of, taking care of their mother. So I, I like very much a husband who makes breakfast uh, and uh, who learns how to really be working as a team together. And uh, I know that you have such a good life that you are able to commit yourself to others. And if you are an Orthodox person, I think it's very good to have, to have uh, something that you go from generation to generation to generation. I'm living with someone 
from uh, South Africa, and she's kosher. So when she moved in, I said, I don't know where I'm going to take your pots and pans. And she says, I only have three. <laughs> I, I, just three pots and pans. We get along really well. I may someday become kosher myself. She's very healthy. She does, but she doesn't eat meat. Not an eat meat. So I think uh, if you're changing, you're switching gears in a car, but then you have to release the clutch. So if you're moving on, find out what you're holding on to and what are you willing to let go of? Because my definition of love is the ability to let go. Yeah. On the topic of, of um, parents getting along and not just having superficial conversation, one of the things that I tell parents of children with whom I work is that children will do better from having growing Mary, parents. Mary, you make yourself a po pony. Children will do better from having growing parents than they will from having perfect parents. Children need to see that their parents are growing. They can argue, no. and they can fight, but they can make up and not that they're always perfect with each other. Because if they see perfect parents, they learn that life is about being perfect. And if they see growing parents, they learn that life is about growing. Yeah, there is no perfect anything. I think we are hopefully growing. And if you don't know something, Maybe you can look it up together. Maybe you can go to the library and research something. I think it's very good to have a relationship. But you know, in Hungary, we say that the fish is thinking from the head. So it's, you know, you're the one who's showing the children that you never did that before. And you may just not really do anything perfectly anything. No, yeah. no such thing as being perfect or anything. Dr. Eger, did you grow up speaking Hungarian or Yiddish? Hungarian. Not Yiddish. A masterpiece. I could smell it all over the house. And that challah at night and that Friday night dinner was a most beautiful, beautiful tradition in my home. My mother was an amazing cook and she made some fish, but like a jelly, jelly around it, something. Aspic. Aspic, yes. Wonderful, wonderful. Yes, my mom was uh, very, very sad. I call it melancholy because her mother died when she was nine years old. And when she woke up, mother was not waking up and they, they buried the mother that afternoon. And she believed that they, they buried her mother, when she was not dead yet, I don't know how she came up. Every day she was praying to her mother and her picture was above the piano. I can picture her now. My, my mother not, was not smart, she was wise. My, she was a wise, wise woman, but she married a, a tailor and I became my father's confidant and told me that my mother is married down. In Europe, you either married down or you married up. And my father felt that my mother was just looking at him as a tailor. So he became a couturier and he told me I'll be the best dressed girl in town when I grow up. So Papa, watch me, yes, yes. I buy good things and I wear it for many, many years and people told, you know, I just bought it. 
it's yes. been you. And, I, and we, we talked before the show about how you 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 remind so many of us of the Alta Babis that we had growing up in Brooklyn who spoke like you and looked like you and dressed like you and you know and and uh, the the counter transference that were experienced. Can we take a question from Elka? Go ahead. Hi. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Eager. I'm, I'm one of the many millions who read your book once or twice or maybe three times. And so much to learn, really. So, so much to learn. So thank you so, so much. Um, I have a question. You write in great detail about how you met your husband in the train station and you were the little kid and he was the, and then, you know, you go on how you got married to him and then you separated and then you went back and then he went with you to Auschwitz and all that. Um, I'm, I'm sure that looking back now, you have a lot of insight in how you met, you know, then separated and then got back together. Um, so I'm wondering if you, you're able to share that with us. Thank you. My people ask me, did you love your husband? And my answer is love. I was very skinny. I was very, very lonely. And most of all, I was very hungry. And this guy bought me Hungarian salami. That's how I married him. So I either became his mother or his child. And when we got a divorce, it had nothing to do with him. It was me. It was me grieving that I never had a childhood. I never had a teenage year. And somehow, unfortunately, I didn't have any eager to go to. And I divorced my husband but I didn't go back to my husband. When we met, I was a woman to a man, not a parent, not a child. And I think we had the most wonderful, wonderful years. And the TB came back and took his life. And that's the story with my beautiful, wonderful Bela was his name in Hungary. And in America, they called him Albert and Al, but uh, he was Bela and a beautiful man who became a CPA. So when we were here in San Diego, my daughter told me, I want my children to grow up with grandparents, not the way I was. I didn't have any grandparents. So my late husband and I moved into La Jolla to this home that I bought for my daughter. And guess what happened? They, they left, they took off. So be careful not to follow your <laughs> parents because not to follow your children. Be careful because they may just you know, not be there when, you, when you're around. So, I think it's very important to develop a relationship with your blood. And I'm so happy that I'm able to be 93. And I have three children, five grandchildren, and seven great grandsons. And that's my best revenge to Hitler. Beautiful. Okay, somebody. Um, can somebody? I just ask? I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. Um, so I just to make sure to clarify. So what you're saying is, is that the first time you met him was out of desperate, like you were desperate. And then the second time you're a person like you needed that time to do the self growth from both ends and then you were able to be in a healthy relationship. Yes, I think it's very important uh, to marry your best friend and to become soulmates. You see the romantic love, falling in love is a chemical high that lonely people get from chocolate. It has nothing to do with love. Right, so okay, thank you. Falling in love, it's like you fall in a hole <laughs> and then you fall out of love, you fell out of a tree. So be careful when you talk to your teenager and he or she tells you that they are in love. No, no, that's really, something that you want to question. 
Yeah. I, love it. I sometimes say you, you don't enter a relationship, you make a relationship. You got it. You got it. And I really like the pioneer woman in America because she worked together with the husband. See? When my daughter got pregnant, she said, we are pregnant. And I love that, that the husband goes to, uh, uh, to the birthing room and bonds with a little girl. There is never, not one uh, molestation just doesn't exist at all. Where is this? In that Where is this that you're saying that molestation doesn't exist? Where is it that you're saying molestation does not exist? When the husband is part of the birthing process and bonds with the baby, never ever uh, touching inappropriately exist. Fascinating. Let's go to yes. the person on the iPhone. I don't know who it is. Uh, just a second before we do that, Moisha, yes. I wanted to ask you just to manage expectations. How yes. how late do you usually go? So we we go we usually go between a quarter after and uh, seven thirty or ten thirty by us. But it, okay. but I'm going to take Dr. Aker's cue. Okay. All right. She's all right. I I said time. She said another hour. I <laughs> saw <laughs> so you say another hour. You said we have time. I'm I'm just beginning. <laughs> okay. We can always have you back tomorrow night. Okay. Just ready to begin. Okay. Go. Whoever's on the iPhone, go ahead. Hi. Yeah. So this has been very inspiring. I want to thank you so much. And I gained so much from reading your book. Um, my question is, what is your advice for someone with very distorted inner negative beliefs? Distorted inner negative beliefs. Um, What's the advice for that behavior? Um. Uh, It's very important to think about your thinking and pay attention what you're paying attention to. Very, very important uh, because you look as to uh, the secondary gains. That's something that gives you control and power. That's what it is. It's all about control and power how much we need and how much are we willing to let go of. My definition of love is the ability to let go. So I think I like, I like the, the couple to work together as a pair and empower each other with their differences. That I don't have to be like you. Two people are not one but two people can really respect one another because the best thing is for marriage. It's like building a house. And the first, the first thing building a house is that you need a base and the base is trust. Okay, let's move to Tova. Thank you for that. Go ahead, Tova. Hi. So first of all, I wanted to tell you that I'm a huge fan. Like everyone has said, I've read both of your books. I recommend them to my clients and my kids. Um, very, very just beautiful ideas and for my personal life and for my clients. So my question for you is at the beginning of your first book, you spoke about how you went to the camp with your sister and right away when she was bald and undressed, you were able to focus on the beauty of her blue eyes and you were able to tell her how beautiful her eyes look. My question for you is, in you know our personal lives and in when while working with clients, how are we able to zone in on that and sort of picking out the positivity when there's so much pain around us? Mm. The pain makes us stronger and we can choose how much pain do we allow ourselves to really respond to, to be able to recognize that 
I may not have to do anything, just listen, take the stimulus, whatever, and then make something out of it that makes me look at the same thing from a different way, different perspective, not better or worse, but different. So Auschwitz then became very importantly, a place where I brought in a lot of curiosity. And that curiosity wanted me to know what's going to happen next, that I would never, ever give up. It's very important to think about your thinking and pay attention what you're paying attention to. And you have a family inside you. You have a little girl there. And maybe that little girl is crying now and saying, I want a healthy mommy. And you show up for that little girl. Dr. Eager, can we take a question now from Faye? Um, so uh, like everyone, I am in awe of you. I am not a therapist. I'm married to a therapist and the mother of three. So uh, I am an engineer and a mathematician and scientist in my training. But I am here because I'm also the daughter of survivors who um, were not in the camps, but were running the entire time. And I have never been able to go back. My husband did go back to Europe. Um, and I was most taken by the part of your book when you went back, when you yes. slept in the bed of Goebbels and how you were able to come to that forgiveness. And I guess um, that's something that I'm still struggling with. Well, I realized that I'm not really getting anywhere with my therapy that I got to go back to that lion's den and look at the lion in the face and reclaim my innocence. So I asked my sister to come home, come with me. And she told me I'm an idiot, that I'm a masochist. What's the matter with me? Didn't I have enough? I didn't ask her the second time. And today that's the work I do. You revisit the places where you've been you relive that experience and then you revise your life. You don't get stuck in there. And that's the work I do today. And that's the best thing I've done for me to go back to Auschwitz, to go to that barrack where I danced for Dr. Mengele, to be able to reclaim my innocence, assigned to shame and guilt to him that then when I was coming out, there was a guy with some kind of a human uniform and I thought for a moment that it was the Nazi and I was back. And I realized that I had a blue American passport in my pocket. But I'm not Popeye. And I tell you, I am so glad that I had nuts enough to go back there and reclaim myself, my true self. I don't live in Auschwitz, but I never forget it or overcome it. Part of me was left in Auschwitz, but not the better part. So I don't run from it. I went to have some steak the other day, and mm. I was walking on cobblestones. Nobody paid any attention on the cobblestones as, as me. Immediately, here it was again, the cobblestones, when children were spitting at us and calling us pigs and swine and God knows what, when we were walking from one place to another. 
So um, you never know when something is going to trigger what. Yeah, can, we take a, go ahead. can we take a last question? This is from Anonymous, whoever Anonymous is. This is going to be the last question and then we'll close. Uh, I think we're doing it more for Katie than for Dr. Ager. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> well, Thanks. I have time this morning. All right, Katie, <laughs> it's all yours. Go ahead, Anonymous. Hi, Dr. Katie. Ager, thank you. Katie's husband died and she's going through time of mourning and uh, and uh, and so we're we're kind of here together. I've known this girl for 20 some years now, and she, she's taking care of me beautifully. And I'm so happy that she's here well, tonight. Thank, thank yes. you, sweetie. You didn't have to tell them all that. <laughs> Moshe was just trying some You're good old good fashioned girl. Jewish guilt on me. And you <laughs> right back. With my reality, so, <laughs> Katie, uh, Katie, behind every great, don't, is, don't they say behind every great woman is a great woman? Mm -hmm. Thank God, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Katie is uh, the kindest human being that you want to meet. Uh, Frozen. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. Yes. Let's let's take a question. Go ahead, anonymous. Yeah. Question. Thank you, Doctor Eager. Uh, this has been amazing. Thank um, you. you speak a lot about inner strength. So I'm wondering when. I'm imagine I'm imagining that the inner strength has um started to like what become lower at times, and what to do when people start to lose that strength and that hope of that they're going to make it to the end or whatever it is in the negative situation. How do they maintain that hope and not give up in the middle of the situation? How do you recover when hope is waning? How do you get back on feeling hopeful and faithful and moving forward? Uh, as long as it takes as long as it takes minimum six months to two years. And the, the, the faster you want it, the longer it's going to take. Um, so be patient. Just let it come to you. I think she's speaking, though, just in general, when things become difficult yes. and you've what? been very positive. Yeah. When the going yeah. gets, how does a person inspire and strengthen themselves when the going gets rough for them? Yes, we are prepared for the worst and hope for the best. Beautiful. Okay, Dr. Ager, in closing, we, we pretty much took all the questions and took enough of your time, a lot of your time for, that was 90 minutes. <clears throat> Actually, you got on 15 minutes before, so we're over 100 minutes right now. And uh, for Thank someone you. for someone your age, Kanai Nahara, that's uh, that's a tremendous feat, and we we really appreciate it. I'm wondering if, in closing, there's a message that you would like to impart to, especially to the therapists and mental health professionals, you know, in how you might want to influence their future work, and also to um, the general population who's watching. I would very much like to ask. Uh, the two people who work together to give us a blessing, please. I think she means Leah and you, Moisha. Yes. Oh, my. Oh, I'm, I'm flattered. <laughs> I don't know how much my blessing is worth, but, but um, our rabbis tell us never take lightly the blessing of the layperson. So I, I, my blessing to you, Dr. Ager, is that you continue to spread light for many, yes. many more years to come to spread light and to spread peace and to spread hope. Very good and very good to be a Jew that we can sit Shiva 
And you know what the Torah said? After one year, leave the dead alone. That you, you really are a, a person who can choose to be happy. Because if you're happy, you're going to have joy. And I wish you a lot of joy. And I I have, yes. I'd like to wish you the same back. A lot of joy and to, like my, she said, a long life of continuing to give what you're giving to others. It's so priceless. Thank you very much. And I, I, I could... Go ahead. Give yourself a gift, the gift of life, because there'll never, ever be another you. God bless you. Thank, Thank you. You. I, you know, I, I do have to say before we hang up that I, I can feel such a deep connection just from this discussion and conversation and i know that we had over 200 people maybe 250 people watching and i, I you know I, I would be shocked if all of us didn't feel the same way and next time i'm in san diego which has never happened yet and might never happen i would love to come see you and say hello i never cry but this time i am and that's a very good sign so I wish you a good cry, because what comes out of your body will never make you ill. What stays in there does. So it's good to cry with you, and love you, and wish you well. Well, I'll, and always, cher I'll always cherish this time together. Thank yeah. you. I cherish you. Thank you, Dr. Eder. Thank you, Dr. Eder. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody, and thank you. And we hope to see you. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to take a few week break from Mondays with Maishi. Dr. Eager, it's been an absolute honor. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, Thank everybody. You. Thank you so much, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thank you.